Well, good morning, you guys. I'm hitting the button a little early. I couldn't wait that extra minute until 10 o'clock rolled around here in California. So I hope you guys don't mind. And it is great to know that you're there. I can't see you through the lens of this camera, but you can see me. And I can see you guys in the chat. So, hey, I mentioned this in the chat, but go Bears. Okay. Anybody who can beat Tom Brady, come on, let's do it. So uh, well done, you guys. He, he even phased him a little bit. So <laughs> whatever was going on there, my wife, Jan, is from Chicago. So oh. she's kind of, she's split, you know, 49er bears. So it, and it's, uh, you know, heartwarming for her to see the bears win. I, and I'm with her on that one. So who else is here with us? So uh, both the you guys uh, in Chicago land. I love it. Alexander from Portugal and Brandon from Ohio and Joaquim from Portugal. Thank you for sending me that email. And I love being in touch with you guys. So, okay, well, let's get this party started. I got a few things I got to mention. First of all, who I am. If you don't know, I'm Mark Silver and I'm an author here in Carmel, California. And I am your host. So this show is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo Lab. Listen, you should know by now that you got to make prints. And there's a lot of cool specials. They've got acrylic prints on special, 20% off. They've got, this is the one you ought to take advantage of, uh, fine art prints, 25% off. Pick your favorite. I don't know. Start with one even, but... Get it over to Bay Photo. Get it printed. These guys have incredible customer service. You're going to get 25% off. Put it on the wall. That's the best way to get your work out there. Right, Dan? We want people making prints and books and getting their work out to the world. So that's my message there. All right. Well, without further ado, we've been missing Dan the Man Milner. It's been a long time. And I let... You turned into a gearhead since the last time I saw you, but I, we're, I we'll, we'll save that for the show. <laughs> yeah, I'm a complete hypocrite. That's what we should establish He's just now. turned around, you guys. I don't know what happened. This is what happens when you don't like watch over your guests closely. You never know what's going to happen. But we'll yeah, get to that in the, the show. They left the gate open and I got out. I don't know that um, there's a gate that could keep you in, Dan. That's the thing. There ain't no gate for likely. you. Um, I have a couple of uh, public service announcements before I go. Go for it. Okay. The first is I know I'm going to get a question about why I'm wearing a jacket inside. Yeah, uh, good or question. Or glasses for that matter. Uh, so I just uh, – this is a public service announcement to Americans, which is uh, I live in New Mexico, which is a part of the United States, something I have to remind people of on a regular basis, believe it or not. And Amazing. we're at 7,000 feet. So we've already had snow this year. Oh. And my wife and I leave these, we have huge banks of windows that we leave open because we love the fresh air. So it is a bit nippy inside my house, which is why I'm wearing a jacket. Well, and that explains of, it. What, yeah. And the glasses, by the way, uh, they're I have cool. With this, with this brand, but that's uh, cool though. Come on. Banks of windows and I have really light sensitive eyes. So I am wearing, and by the way, these glasses, which I got in an event, they're, what are I, those? I don't have any affiliation with this brand. Gooder. G-O-O-D-R. They are yeah. the most – these make me want to get contact lenses because, look, they do <laughs> not move. They're super light, and I wow. love these things. So I haven't had contacts in 20 years, and I think I'm going to get contacts because I don't want to take these off. Okay. The other well, thing I want to talk about before yeah. we get into the gear, the gear stuff is that um, if you – any of you out there who are using Blurb, if you open up Blurb BookWrite software today, you will get an update, a refresh – uh, a little software upgrade that will go through and it's a really good one and it's different from anything I've seen in a long time and so it's definitely worth doing refresh book right take a look at it there's a bunch of tools in there now about how to get started very quickly on a book so they've taken away some of the roadblocks on the front end but most importantly and I got this question yesterday and it made me think about something that I think is really important especially for anyone who spends a lot of time with photography or in a serious way which is Anytime when fall arrives and winter arrives, especially living at a 7,000 feet where there's quite a bit of snow and sub-zero temps, I find myself inside a lot more, and the pandemic has magnified that. So 
on a normal year when fall rolls around, I am a bookmaking machine. And what I typically do are two kinds of books. One is expected and the other is kind of unexpected. One is I, I, I tend to recap the year. I do like a portfolio from the year and I don't really have any use for this. I don't send it out to people. I do it for myself to sort of recap what I had success, success with during the year and just put it into print. I typically print one or two copies and that's it. It's not like I'm yeah. sending it out in the world trying to get famous. The second thing that I do is that I make personal books about family. And like this is a little book I made about my nephew whose nickname is Super Dynamite. And so I do these books and I think the personal books get, get overlooked because anyone who's a photographer, especially a professional photographer, they're always, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to make things that put us on the map or keep us on the map or get us fame or get us followers or get us assignments or whatever. And we look at personal books and we go, those aren't really valid. But the truth is, like in my family, I am the documentarian. My mother was for 40 years, and I remember the day she came to me and said, I'm done. This is on you now. You have to document the family. It's a huge responsibility. But three of the best books I've ever made in my life are about my family. You will never see them. No one else will ever see them. But they are really important. So if you're out there thinking about what books to make, do not overlook your family history. That because is if so your family true. history is on a hard drive, it's gone, baby. That gone, is baby, so gone. true. Absolutely. And hey, right, um, should we talk about this? Should we talk yeah, about this? Yeah, before we do that, let's just put the link. Jared, will you put the link into uh, what? What's the best link that for for the blurb uh, book? Right, just yeah, just go to blurb.com, and it's very easy to find right off of the right off of the homepage. And then uh, anybody who already has it installed, all you have to do is open it, and you'll see an update pop up. It'll it'll up, update all of the new uh, refinements to the to the program. I just went through it this morning for the first time. And I was like, oh, okay, this is definitely good. And the new templates and stuff they brought in are, are far superior to what we had in the past. Awesome. All right, Dan, should we dive into our subject matter here? It's yeah. uh, and I, I think why you got to keep your I gear simple. Yeah, before I butchered this and contradicted everything I've ever said. But I have reasons why I've fallen off, right? I have reasons why I've <laughs> contradicted everything. There's I've always a reason. There's always a okay. reason. It, I, I think in general, the idea we had today was to talk about why it's important to keep everything simple, right? Yes. And you're like, oh, I'll just use a minimal amount. So I have, I have a couple of reasons why I think that's important. Number one, uh, it's less expensive. If you, if you just have, you know, my primary camera is four years old. I have one lens that's glued to it that I never take off. And if that's all I use and all I, and all I need... I don't need to spend money on anything else. And so what I spend money on is travel, books, education, journal supplies, art supplies, et cetera. I don't need to go blow thousands and thousands of dollars on new gear every year because why? When if I have something that works, and I mentioned this before, my two primary film cameras are 50 years old. You know, there's no firmware upgrades. There's no software <laughs> That's upgrades. Right. There's nothing. They work just like they did 50 years ago. And so... When I shoot film, which is rare these days, just for logistical reasons, but you know, I don't need anything else. And yes, um, and I'll mention here in a minute, I just got approval to buy a new camera. Blurb is going to uh, allow me to get a new camera that I'll mention in a second. But the X-T2 that I use now, it works fine. And I have this 50 millimeter, this Speedmaster fast 50 millimeter, which I really like. It's manual focus. And that's all I really need. You know, It's not like I have to and the last thing in the world, and I don't know if this has to do with getting Lyme disease and just being like cognitively challenged or lazy maybe, but I can't imagine getting op an opportunity to go in the field to work and spending a moment like fumbling around as to what gear I'm going to use. It just seems so counterintuitive because you have such limited, finite opportunity. That's if you right. think about it. If you think about what good, like from in my case, documentary photography. You're, you're, you're looking for one once-in-a-lifetime moments that are happening in the right light with the right timing with your composition, and then they never exist ever again. The odds of getting that are so, so slim and so small that even if I'm in the field doing nothing but trying to make photographs, it is so hard and unlikely that I'm going to make something great that if I'm sitting there fumbling around wondering, hmm, you know, do I go to manual mode or do I use aperture? Pro I mean, it, it's gone. You're, you yes. don't have a chance. Okay. Does that so make true. Sense? Less, ex less expensive. Good point. I know the camera co camera companies probably don't like that point, but no, it's but, true. but we're the consumers and we have control over our own spending. Absolutely. Out. 
Point number two, uh, and this is, again, just another logistical thing. It's less to carry. I, I, I kid you not. Yeah. I am 51, and right now, as we sit here, I have to the left of my spine, just below my neck, is a stabbing pain that I get about three times a year, and it came from carrying a camera bag for 25 years. Wow. And, you know, I was a newspaper photographer. I was a magazine person. So I had, you know, multiple cameras, two bodies, two lenses, strobe, you know, all this stuff. It screwed up my back. You know, I have back and neck pain. And every time I get a massage, which is pretty rare, the masseuse always within five minutes looks at me and says, how are you not in pain? How, how, how do you have headaches? Are you dizzy? You know, your back is a train wreck. And that came from carrying too much stuff. So carrying a simple, one simple, small thing, it, you're physically, and this is a point that I talk about all the time with people who are interested in documentary photography, and it gets overlooked and kind of, um, kind of poo-pooed, if you will, is your physical shape. Yeah. You know, if you, and I learned this way back in the day when I started assisting for other photographers, I had to be in shape. Yeah. You know, you had to literally be able to run and to move and be agile and have good cardio and everything else. And it doesn't, you know, historically, you look at documentary photographers and they're wearing a scarf and smoking a cigarette and they're drinking and all that stuff. And that's a fallacy, right? I mean, those people still exist. But for the most part, that that era is gone. Yeah. You know, you have to be you have to want it and you have to be physically ready. And so if your body is breaking down because you're carrying, you know, massive camera bags and massive amounts of equipment. And I've seen people do this traveling as well when I teach workshops. And, you know, people are out there and they're walking around with this stuff on them. And I'm like, you know, by, it, it, when you're climbing the steps at Machu Picchu, that doesn't help. Like you want it to be fast and agile and in shape. So point number two is you have a lot less to carry. And trust and me, on, on that one, you think this is never going to happen. On that it's note too, happen. Dan, you know, if you visualize a photograph and maybe it's a quarter of a mile away, and you got to hustle over there. You're going to miss it if you're sh schlepping all this stuff around. I mean, you're just going to be slowed down. So, it's it's good to be lean and and agile, as you said. I was in uh, Death Valley last year working on a project, which is still ongoing, and I'm hoping, as I mentioned before, I'm hoping to get out there soon. Uh, and I realized I parked my car, and I'm at the base of a mountain. And I realized that what I need to photograph is about to go down and, and what I have, where I have to be is on top of the mountain. Yeah. And I have a backpack. I have my Atlas pack that has my gear in it because out there I need a, I need a pack system that really carries well. Not like a camera bag company, but like an adventure company that happens to make a backpack that works for camera gear. Right. And I use this thing called an Atlas pack for that. And I'm literally, I pack this thing up and it has like cold weather gear, food, water, all my gear, you know, everything. And I run up this mountain and we're talking switchbacks and I knew when I left the car I was like all the running I do all the cycling I do all the yoga I do that's why because I have to keep my heart rate at a certain level and I have to get to the top of this peak before otherwise it's gone and Boom. I remember getting up there and then doing like a, you know 10 seconds of deep breathing to get my heart rate down as I'm uh, taking all this gear out to get ready and I got it and I mean if you're not in shape and you're not ready to do that kind of thing then you're gonna miss it and and look I'm not like Mr. Athlete or whatever but again learned behavior I 25 years ago I never would have thought of this but now I'm like this is a critical part of it so true. so point point number one less expense point number two less to carry if your inner child is lazy like mine uh, and point number three, and this is kind of kind of fun because 25 years ago, I would not have said this. It would have been the opposite. But if you walk in and you roll up on a scene today and you're carrying a bunch of camera equipment, it's not good because people look at you and they go, uh oh, there's a professional photographer here. Yeah. And all of the misconceptions about professional photography start coming in. Oh, you're getting rich off of us. Oh, you're going to get famous. Oh, you're going to do this and that. All the stuff that's completely bizarre and inaccurate. You don't want to look like a pro anymore. You know, 25 right. years ago when I started, it was beneficial to look like a pro because people had respect for it, especially like a journalist or a photojournalist. They would bend over backwards to help you. They would protect you. They would help you get access. They were excited that you were there because if you were a professional and you had a credential that said, I'm a professional photographer, it meant that you were vetted that they could trust you, that you'd gone through training, that you'd been vetted, because not everybody can get a press credential. These days, all of that is out the window. And yeah. so 
you roll up looking like a pro carrying 15 pounds of equipment, people go, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, I don't want you here. And I've seen that happen 100 times in the past couple of years. That's why it's very nice to just simplify, carry something small and simple and not, even if you are a professional, there's no benefit in rolling in looking like, you know, you're, you're armed to the teeth. So that And, you know, on that point. point too, Dan, you actually get screened out by the security guys too. I mean, they, they oh, don't, heck yeah. right? So I've been to, you know, a jazz concert. As soon as I pulled out these big cameras, uh-uh. I mean, I eventually ended up getting in, but... If you're if you're if you're advertising, hey, I'm a pro and I'm going to do something with these photographs, you end up with all sorts of uh, barriers in front of you that that are just eliminated with a small, simple system. How about customs? Oh, you yeah. know how many times I've been stopped going into other countries and they go, hey, hey, what's all this equipment? And in some countries That's that will cool remain nameless, that are very close to the United States, they will put your butt right back on the plane and turn you around if they don't like it. And so I've been detained multiple times, um, some on, when I was on assignment and others while I was I was traveling by myself just on a personal project. And they wanted they were like, uh-uh. And even on some of the customs forms flying into Latin America, they'll ask if you have more than one camera. They'll ask if you have more than 12 rolls of film. And, you know, you're, you're, the odds are you either risk it and you don't declare it. Or if you do, they label you a pro and then you got problems because they're going to want money for tariffs and all kinds of stuff. So you don't want to look like a pro these days. And I know that sounds weird, but I think that's uh, the truth. Um, number four. So are we ready for number four? We're ready for number four. Are people sobbing or are they laughing with joy? I don't know. Uh, it's hard uh, to say. Point, point number four is something I have mentioned many, many, many times. It is painfully obvious, and that is the less you have, the more time you can think about your actual imagery. You know, again, I've seen millions, of, not millions, I've seen many, many people in the field staring at the back of their camera while, the, while life unfolds in front of them, and they're missing every single thing because they're looking, they're in the menus, or they're switching lenses, or they're going from body to body. The key is light timing and composition. That's all that matters is light timing composition. And however you frame that is however you frame it. But the, to have simplify and just use one thing is essential because if you're trying to do two things at once, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example of this in a minute, but it's just you have to think about what's going on in front of you, especially if you're what I call a reality-based documentary photographer, which is, and these are, there are fewer and fewer of us roaming the earth uh, for a variety of reasons, but this is, I don't orchestrate things in the field. And I, uh, the only time I would orchestrate is if I'm hired to do a portrait or I see somebody that like I'm, I've been working with on and on and on. And I say to them, I need a really an official portrait of you. Then I will pose them. I'll find the light I want to work in, et cetera. But for the rest of the time in the field, I do not orchestrate. I don't hint for people to do things. I don't casually suggest they move to another location. You'll hear photographers all the time talk about this. And in reality, there's a whole kinds of all kinds of ways to skirt around the truth on this issue. And I've seen it by, with my own eyes in real time out in the field watching other photographers. But to me, if you're orchestrating an image, you are not you're no longer a documentary photographer unless you're doing a portrait series, you know, or an environmental portrait series. The second you start or orchestrating, you're a commercial photographer. And I've seen this over and over again. And so when you're a reality based photographer, and you are, you're going to win some battles and you're going to lose some. And you have to be comfortable with losing the battle, which means you have to be comfortable with missing things. And some people aren't, some people aren't. And so the ones who aren't will stage, recreate, fake, hint, organize. All kinds of famous pros have gotten into trouble over the years for doing this. You know, things that came out down the road. It was like, how did those things, how did those elements? So... It's just about the light, the timing, and the comp and, and the composition is what you're after. And the less equipment that's in front of you to, to mangle those facts is the better off you're going to be. And it's just more fun. Again, all these are tied together. You have less to carry, so physically you feel better. You don't look like a pro. You haven't spent all your money on your equipment. You can go out and eat a fancy dinner at the end of the day because you're like, hey, I didn't buy a Superflex <laughs> 5000. I saved all the money, and now I'm going to go, you know get uh i don't know tequila shots whatever whatever go. whatever floats your boat let me let me interject something at this point it's a perfect time to bring it up so we are going to give you guys this pdf which is a piece of from my book create 
written by a friend of mine called uh, Keith Code. If you don't know who he is, he's an amazing motorcycle racer, and he runs the California Superbike School. Anyway, he allowed me to reprint a section from his book called What'll It Cost? And essentially, he's talking about what happens if your attention is tied up in your equipment. You have a certain amount of that attention and if it's mostly tied up on your equipment, you have very little attention to put outside into the rest of the world. Jared will stick the link in there. Make sure you guys get it. Okay, because it really does clarify this whole point. And I'm sorry, but I, before I go any further, I want to remind you guys who haven't already done so, please subscribe and enable the bell because we want you guys to be with us on all of our stuff. Okay, back to you, amigo. I saw some one equipment more, coming up. One more point. We're going to talk about one more point, and then I'm going to talk about five versions of me, all real at this point, and one after the other, least of, less effective than the version before. But I'll get to that in a minute. The last point of minimizing the equipment, and this is potentially the most important thing, because at the end of the day, I don't care how many followers you have. I don't care how many people tell you you're great. You cannot hide from your negatives. You either have it or you don't. And so when you consolidate on a specific lens or two bodies and two lenses and you, you specifically consolidate, you will have a consistency to the work. And it's, for anyone who's shooting in long form, who's doing essays or stories or photo projects, there has to be consistency. In fact, someone just reached out to me recently and said that they had entered a contest and the judges sort of wrote them back and said, you should have consolidated on one aspect ratio because he had done like multiple things. Uh. When you throw in color and black and white, multiple aspect ratios and multiple lenses and all this stuff, trying to make sense of it is nearly impossible. So you want a consistency to the look. And to do that, you have to eliminate distraction and eliminate all these other factors. And so if I'm shooting with a 20 to 35 and a 70 to 200 and an 85 and a fast 50, and maybe I've got a fish eye in there, all this stuff, what you get, what you end up with is a mess. It looks That's like a right. yard sale, right? It's a yard sale of imagery. <laughs> and then everyone goes, how am I going to make a book out of this? How am I going to make a net magazine essay? There's no consistency to the look. So it's really, that's probably the core argument for minimizing the equipment is that this is about our ultimate images. This isn't about a dance. This isn't a, the prom of photo equipment and everybody dances around. Now, you, it, one of the interesting factors is if you cover a public event, especially today when there's like exponentially more photographers than ever before, you will see people who are what I would call legitimate photographers who are working that scene. And then you have people who show up to look at other people's equipment. And this has always happened. It's always been this way. It's happened since I started shooting in the late 80s. But there's a lot more of those people today. And the truth is, it doesn't matter. Like, because the people who are legitimate at the end of the day are going to look into the magazines to see who got published and what those images were like. Um, the New Yorker ran an essay recently from the Black Lives Matters protests. And man, it was really solid. Like I have, I don't know what that guy used equipment wise or that person used. I don't care. I never once looked at that essay and said, gee, I wonder what 50 millimeter lens he was using. Yeah. I don't care. I looked at that essay and said, first of all, why is a literary magazine running a 20 page double truck photo essay? What happened to all the news magazines? They're dead and gone. But I looked at that and I said, okay, great work, great placement, great design. That's a photo editor who actually knows what they're doing. And a designer, you know, page layout person that knows what they're doing. But man, those images are powerful. That's the key. It has yeah. nothing to do with what what gear he used. Okay, Shoot. that was my five points of the day. Okay. I still have back pain. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through five versions of myself, all real. Wow, I'm I'm ready for this one. <laughs> and and th they will get progressively dumber and dumber and dumber however the as the dumb scale increases sort so does the reality of the frequency of how often i have to live as this other version of myself okay so the first version of me the best version of me is one camera with a 50 and my notebook that's how i make the best work i've ever done right going back for 28 years 
if you look at all the, if you took all the still photography that I've done that, that I say that I think is decent work, that's what I was doing. 50 millimeter, sometimes a 35, but most of the time, 50 millimeter and a notebook to take down, you know, notes, thoughts, ideas, conversation, dialogue, all the copy that goes when I'm laying out a book. That's the best version of me. But there's Boom. a second version. There's a second version of me that's creeping in from time to time. And the second version is camera with 50, notebook, audio recorder. Now what have I done? I've added something else. I added something to the mix that requires a totally different mindset, that requires another bag of equipment. I love it. I do love sound. I love sound and still images mixed together is one of my all-time favorite things. But the truth is, now that I'm doing this, I'm doing less of this. Mm. It's a balance. Yeah. You know, I have to, I can't, this means two things at once. It is a physiological impossibility for the human brain to do two things at once. So this means, this adds audio, means I don't make as good as a work with this. That's the harsh reality. Oh, but it gets better. <clears throat> That's giving up that uh, you know the ten bucks that you've got of attention, and you've now yeah. now you're oh, yeah. you're you're putting five dollars over to the audio recorder. So you've got oh, five Mark, bucks. Mark, I'm, get, I'm getting ready to give away all my money. Stay tuned. Okay, let's hear let's hear how it's going here. Third version, fifty millimeter notebook, audio recorder, and oh look, a new Sony ZV1 vlogging camera with a Bluetooth remote to control the camera functions which means that I can turn this on and I can vlog and it's handheld and image stabilized. So I just got this because all the YouTube stuff I'm doing, which is not for me per se, it's, I work for Blurb full time. I have a whole range of duties that I'm on the hook for. I did not have anything small that was stabilized. I had to always use a tripod 100% of the time and that's a problem for me with someone yeah. who's out in the field so much, I needed something. So now, I have the 50, I have the notebook, I have the audio recorder, and I have this. This makes it even worse. So now, imagine how much how much less time I get with this. Because now I'm sh I just added motion. You're just spending that money all over the place. Spending the money. With the ZB1's super affordable, and they make this. This is called their vlogging package, so it's a pretty easy thing to get into. It's literally the size of my hand. It's super light. It works great. I don't know all the menus and all the functions and all that. I don't care. It works great. And it also works with my little lab mics, too, by the way. Uh, but it reduces the time for these. Yeah. So now my audio is not as good. And my stills aren't as good because now I'm adding motion in. And I'm not writing as much because now I have to edit the motion. Oh, but it gets better. You're thinking, geez, Dan. This is the confessions of, 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 the, of Dan Milner. I mean, this is you amazing. You can destroy yourself even more. But, oh, yes, I can. Because there's a fourth version of me, which is 50 the journal, the audio recorder, and the Sony. And oh, by the way, Blurb just approved me to buy a Fuji X-T4. So it's the new image stabilized version of this, which means I will now have two cameras that are image stabilized and one, a better still camera with better autofocus than this one. So like my Death Valley project where autofocus is a big need, a really important need. The X-T2 is, is slow compared to the X-T4, but I'm not getting rid of the X-T2s because I need those lenses and I don't have time to change and I'm in a dusty environment, which means if you pull a lens off and change, your sensor is going to get covered in dust and you're totally. out of luck. So I cannot take, once I hit Death Valley, I cannot take lenses off bodies. They stay on permanently. So now I have three Fuji bodies. I have the Sony camera for motion. I have my audio recorder, my journal, and my 50. So I just reduced this time even more. And I reduced everything because now I'm trying to do four things at once. And you're thinking it could not possibly get any worse. Well, you, you haven't worse. added in the bottle of tequila to calm things down because your attention's going all over the place. That's, That's coming, right? That's breakfast. That's my breakfast, Mark. Yeah, I knew tequila. that. So it, you you could you think to yourself, you're an idiot. Like, why would you do this? Now, remember, I'm work. I have a full time job. I'm producing content for a variety of different people for a variety of different reasons. I can't just go out on my own and do my own thing. If I was, I would do the fifty in the journal. That's what I would do because that's the best work I've ever done. 
So now the fifth version and last and final most ruined version of me, for those of you who think that having all this gear is a good thing, I'm dispelling that notion right now. So the last version of me has my trusty 50, always has the trusty notebook, loves audio, has to shoot motion, now has a super fancy X-T4 mm. autofocus with my long lens on it ready to use. And then, oh, by the way, why not add a drone into the mix? The drone <laughs> that I've owned for three weeks and just now took out of the box. The drone that's never been in the air because I'm too busy to actually use it. Now I have five things that I'm trying to do at the same time. Now, here's the interesting note. YouTube is filled and the content creation world is filled with people who are doing this right? They're doing yeah. all of these things at the same time. That's the job now. The days of being a still photographer, whether you're a newspaper person, now those people are shooting video, carrying drones, they're doing all the same stuff. So there's, a, there's plenty of people in the, in the content world that are doing this, but I'm using a word that is very synonymous with obliterating your brain, and that's the word content. When you see a real filmmaker versus a content producer, what you typically see is the number of crew magnified exponentially. You have, like, when I see a really good film, it tends to be either a DSLR crew, which is a, a two cameramen, a producer, a sound guy, and an editor. Um, and very rarely do you see things that are made by individuals that cover all the bases. They might yeah. have cinematic motion footage. They might have great sound. They might have a great still. Maybe someone wrote a great script, but very rarely do they combine all those elements because, again, it's a physiological impossibility to do more than one thing at a time. Your brain does not know how to do that. Your brain toggles. And so your brain will get like a computer and it will, it will freeze up and then you have to reboot. And that happens to all of us. And so if you're going to make the best possible work that you can possibly do, there is no way to do that by doing what I'm doing now, which is all of these different things. Because when I go in the field later today to test fly this drone for the first time, that is gonna take 100% of my attention to not crash the drone. I That's guarantee right. it, because I've That's never right. done it before. Why bother taking, taking any other equipment when, 90, when, when to your point about your motorcycle friend, $9.50 is on the drone. That's right. I've got 50, why would I bother with 50 cents trying to shoot stills when I'm trying not to crash a drone that I've never flown before. So we think all this stuff is amazing and it's, you know, wow, it's really great. You have all that stuff, but the proof is in the pudding. Like, what am I making with it? I released a film about five minutes before we started this, this talk and it's called Everyday Expedition. And it's a series that I've been dreaming about starting forever, which is about for people like you and I that have nine to five jobs or eight to six or seven to nine or whatever hellish grind that we're on, 24 we seven. Still, we, we still want to experience the world. We still want to have adventures, but we are not going to Mount Everest. We're not swimming the Ganges. We're, we're, we have to pick and choose our little battles close to home. And so I did this film. It's not very good. It took, it took me four days of creating content to try to make this film. And within 10 minutes of sitting down to edit, I realized I didn't have enough footage. I didn't have enough. And I had stills and audio and motion and 4K and 1080 and all this stuff, no drone yet, but all this stuff. And I, I just realized like, you know, maybe the script is okay. I wrote a decent script, but the rest of it isn't great because I can't do all of that stuff at the same time. And oh, by the way, I was fly fishing. The point of the film is, is, was dry fly fishing up on, in the Northern part of the state for rainbow trout. So I'm, I'm in the process of trying to catch rainbow trout I'm shooting stills, recording audio, and shooting motion at the same time. This I've got to see. This talk about spending. You're way over your budget on the ten dollars. You, you're into a hundred bucks here. With, I it's mean, a, just to fly fish, the uh, the attention it takes to do that, right? And know what yeah. you're doing and casting and. Yeah, no, I mean, I've been fly fishing my whole life, so that's at this point, it's pretty second nature to me. I can sort of show up and I know how to how to read water and I know how to fish. And that's, that's sort of the relief, right? Because I get up there and yeah. I love doing this. My mother taught me how to do it when I was in grade school. And I've been doing it the whole, my whole life. And for me to be in those environments is the key point. I don't care if I ever catch a fish. I don't care if I get a strike. It's being standing on that river or in that yeah. river. I hear with you. With nobody else around and no cell signal. And I'm isolated. And it's absolutely fantastic. And then my brain says, 
oh, dude, you're supposed to be filming this and shooting stills and, like, catch and release trout without injuring them and recording sound and then trying to piece this together and storyboarding in your head. And you're like, oh, man, this is not easy. And so it would have been a lot easier to just go with a, with a camera and a notebook and, and fish and do that. But I can't now because I have these other responsibilities. So for those of you out there who have the luxury of a single lens and a body and a notebook, man, just understand how fantastic that is. That you don't need. And, and by the way, when you get home from a shoot like that, there's no need to edit and put it online. Just sit with it. Just live with it for a while. Yeah. Just relax. Plan your next shoot. Maybe maybe take a quick look at the images. Make a quick edit, but don't make any rash decisions. No need to post everything in real time. Just enjoy it because I took it for granted. I took for granted those years of, of when I had like my Leica, my two Leicas and two lenses and a bag of Tri-X, and I was traveling all over the world doing projects. I had no internet. I had no computer. I had no idea how good that was, how fantastic that was. I never got stopped with two Leicas and two lenses and a bag of film. No one bothered me. I could show up and do any, you know, I had time, so much time on these, you know, we'd spend weeks at a time in the field. I haven't done that in 10 years. Like, I, it's never going to happen again unless, you know, I win the lottery. So there you have it, folks. Confessions of a reformed gearhead going back to the old days. Actually, we haven't reformed the gearhead. You are a gearhead that needs to be reformed. But yeah. down basic, the basic Dan Milner is the one that you started with. And that's the one that we all love and admire because that's the guy with the 50 and the notebook. Right? That's it. That's it. That's well, Dan, the actual that's the actual me. That's the left, core you. That's the basic personality of, of Dan Milner. Yeah, that's that's the that's the way I like to work. It's the the lack of devices, that's who I would be, but it's, you know, modern life gets in the way. You know, on on expeditions or backpacking where you're going, you have to you're forced to go light. You cannot carry around a lot of stuff with you because you're carrying it on your back. And that actually forces us to remain really simple and in tune with what what is this all about anyway it's capturing an image or images that that tell a story and that's the core of photography and it's been hijacked i say verily it's been hijacked by the consumerism and turned into something completely different because as to your point 50 years ago 20 years ago you would buy a camera it never went obsolete it just didn't. Yeah. You could use it, you know. But now the stuff goes obsolete so quickly, and we're, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff to get. I I'm going to get a drone. I'm I'm going to be like you. I'm going to be out there trying to figure out how to fly this thing, and and keeping there goes the camera, there goes the still photographs. So, and I my, my reason for buying a drone was actually probably not what people expect and i'm not necessarily going to share all the details about that now but the drone for me is about evidence is about environmental evidence that's why mm. i bought the drone because we have such drastic changes here we had no monsoons this summer the rio grande is about to go dry in albuquerque um this is not good these are unprecedented things that have never happened so my goal with the drone was to just sort of start building a catalog of memory of you know what this is like what you know when next year when it goes dry it's not going to be everyone will have will have automatically accepted it. And so to me, it's like, wow, this stuff, I've never seen the, the Rio Grande go dry in Albuquerque. I want to go film that because that's a pretty interesting thing. And so I will incorporate the drone into my everyday expeditions, into my cycling films and that stuff. But um, and it, you know, it's a perspective that's well worn now. Every every film I see on, on YouTube is, is like that. But, yeah. you know, to your backpacking point, there are some folks on YouTube who are really world-class long-distance backpackers and for example the, these sony cameras are really popular with those yes. folks they tend to use the little sony and they use a gopro and that's it yeah and they make films that are really good and if you like backpacking or you're on the fence about it and you want to see what these folks are doing you know they do tons of reviews about lightweight tents and food and cooking and all this stuff and they go like way overboard on all that stuff but they do films that's it they don't shoot stills Right. Like they, and if they do, their stills aren't very good. 
because they've they've realized to Mark's point, I have to minimize the equipment because I'm literally carrying it on my back for days and weeks at a time. Yeah. And I can't I can't do 50 things at once. I'm just going to film and I'm going to write a script and that's it. And I'm going to cut these together. And they do a really good job. You know, it's a, they, because they've made that decision of I need to pick my battles and I can't be everything to everyone while I'm in the middle of the John Muir trail. I just can't do it. And so, I hear you. You know, that's it's really a good case study. And I think, um, you know, I think there's to, to the thing to the point I said earlier, there's a lot of content and then there's people who are making films. And when you see the people who are making films, it's so inspiring to like say, OK, I don't want to make content anymore. I want to make I want to make something good. The same way we all look at our stills and say, I don't want to make snapshots necessarily. I want to make things that go maybe a little bit beyond that. And we have to simplify most of the time to do it. Beautiful. Boom. Hey, uh, before we sign off, let's pick up some of the questions and comments. Jared, you want to yep. pull a few here? I see I've them coming I've been keeping in. track. We've got some great comments. Uh, people talking about similar experiences of just, you know, the importance of simplicity. Uh, Bert, our friend Bert, uh, said, flew my drone on the first flight and got it stuck in a portable batting cage because of a lot <laughs> wow. of baseball <laughs> photography. And then uh, Daryl gave a great point on the single most important thing that improved his photography was switching to a light camera yeah. with a spare batteries. I can photograph for hours instead of one to two hours. Good point. Uh, so, you know, the, all the equipment in the world isn't going to help you if you've got dead batteries. And then we had a another really good comment, which then somebody else followed up with a really good question. So uh, Paul said, photo enthusiasts buy what they can afford and professional photographers use what they need to do to get their job done. Mm -hmm. uh, professionals are more likely to be efficient. That's and so then true. Jared followed that up, uh, Chicagoland Jared, with a good setup question. When does an enthusiast need to decide and or transition to a pro mentality and adapt that simplicity promoted in this talk? Right now is my answer. The sooner you do it, the better. But I mean, what do you, it what do you say? It depends on... It depends on what the demands are, you know. I mean, the and pros rent, pros rent equipment. Yeah, that's true. You know, if you if you need a forty thousand dollar digital back, they don't buy those; they rent them. You know, rental houses like Sammy's in L.A. or, you know, all the major cities have these rental houses all all over the world because the cost of this equipment is just too high. The return on investment, if you can't pay for it return in six months, you shouldn't buy it. Right. And so they'll they'll rent anything they need because that cost is being passed on to the client. As a photographer, if you're paying for your equipment rentals and all that, you're going backwards. Like that's not a good business move. The client is hiring you to do something. If you don't have clients hiring you and putting demands on you that you can't handle with your current crop of equipment, then you don't need to do anything. You just need to go keep shooting and practicing. It's when you um, it's when you're getting assignments and the and that assignment dictates. Like for example. I don't have an, a good underwater housing. And if I needed to go photograph wherever, North Shore, Oahu, which I would never do because I would drown on those waves in the winter. But if I had to, or I had to hire an assistant who is, who is capable in that kind of work to shoot from the water and that person didn't have a housing, then we would have to rent it. And we would rent that and the client would pay for it. And we would accomplish whatever visual goal that we had or requirement for the assignment. But if you don't have those demands on you, then I wouldn't worry about it. You're actually in a really good, advantageous position to not have to get into this, you know, uh, treadmill of, of upgrades. Because clients are famous for, like, demanding things that they have that make absolutely no sense. Like specific cameras or for specific file sizes. You know, they demand buyouts when they have no reason for a buyout. It's just all kinds of stuff. That's yeah. the minefield of professional photography that you have to learn. Keep it simple, folks. And, you know, when you're talking about drones, it's better, I think, you know, if you're going to do a serious drone shoot, hire a guy with a license who has insurance because today's world with drones, it's a whole different thing. You got to be insured. You got to have the license, and you got to know how to do it. So, is yeah. it worth your time, money, and attention to invest all that energy into those things, or to bring a guy on the set with you, which I've done, who has it all taken care of, and I can collaborate with him in terms of how I want him to shoot? But he's the guy moving the levers, and he's the guy with the insurance policy, and he's the guy with the license. So. 
collaboration is really also very important. And you t you touched upon that, Dan. You're on a yeah. set. You do have an audio guy, and that's what his attention is on, right? You 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 know you have the guy who's shooting stills. You have the script person. You have you know these various different hats are split out now. When guys like you and me push it all into one person, meaning you, yeah, that, then it gets really tricky. But you know, sometimes you have to split it out, and yeah, collaboration so recently, is really very powerful. Recently, someone showed me a film and said, "Can you make a film like this?" And I said, "No." And they were like, "Why?" And I Why said, "Because that's a DSLR crew. That's two shooters, editor, sound guy, producer." So yeah. they show me another film. Can you do this? I said, "No." Why? DSLR crew. I said, I'm one person. I'm not a DSLR crew. I can't shoot two camera lengths at the same time, record audio, produce it, and have an editor and a trailer editing this stuff in real time. I'm like, I'm one person. It ain't happening. So it's defining that stuff. You know, the person asking me this stuff didn't know. They just, they, in their mind, they were like, oh, this content stuff's supposed to be really easy. You have an iPhone, right? And, you know, they're looking at images that were shot with probably three to 400 millimeter lenses on DSLRs with giant tripods and, you know, pr uh, digital previews in the hot shoe. So they're, you know, recorders are looking in real time and they're thinking it was done on an iPhone. And yeah. I'm like, you're talking about two different things. So, you know, as an individual, I know what my limitations are because I've gone over them over and over and over again and realized that's not good enough. The work I'm making, not good enough. It's kind of fun to see what I can get away with. Um, but at the same time in my head, I go, oh, if I'm doing three, four things at a time, I either have to delegate to your point. Like if I had it, if I had it, somebody came to me, if Blurb came and said, we need you to do a drone shoot in San Francisco, we heard you bought a drone. I would say there is no way no I am way. ever doing that. I'm hiring, you know, Jerry Cavassier here in Santa Fe or somebody that's a professional drone operator. And I'm going to say, you know what, we're going to fly him to San, uh, San Francisco. And to your point, he's licensed. Yeah. He has the insurance. He knows how to fly. He's going to look at the conditions and go, nope, too windy. Or yeah. I can't fly here or whatever. I'm not doing that. There's no way. Bingo. Well, Dan, this has been, you know, the power of simplicity. Let's all remember that. Simplify. And I appreciate, do your, conf I I, I appreciate your confessions. And hopefully the next time we come on, we're not going to find five more versions of Dan. But who knows? Could be, right? We keep adding to it, but it's down possible. at the core is that's the guy that loves the simple approach. I do. It's All true. Right. Well, thanks again, Dan. We'll yeah. see you soon. We're going to talk All right. Adios. very soon. Adios, everybody. And you guys, okay, you got the message, right? So don't forget to um, get this PDF from my friend Keith Code because it really kind of consolidates everything we've been talking about here. Jared, why don't you stick that link back in there? Uh, we're going to just go over a couple other news items. Tomorrow we've got none other than our friends Bob Holmes and Andrea Johnson. They have been up in Washington photographing. They had their shoots interrupted by smoke, and they kind of took what I think was like a two or three day shoot and made it over many weeks. We'll find out tomorrow. He's going to summarize. We're doing some summarizing here. He's going to summarize what it means to be a National Geographic photographer. What are the ingredients that go into that? So tomorrow morning, that's Saturday, right? 10 a.m. Pacific. Please tune in for that. Jared, am I leaving anything out? Uh, I, I think we've covered all the bases yeah, I think we that's it. Definitely get that PDF. Even as I was making the PDF and I was I was one of the first readers of Mark's book Create, that's which right, this you is were. an excerpt from. Even it was a great reminder for me. So even if you've read it before, even if if you think, okay, I get the idea, still go through it because you got to process things multiple times. You do. Before we you were, get it. And, you got to get it many, many times. And okay. It's so important. Speaking of processing things many times, would you guys who haven't already taken advantage of it, you know, we're giving this book away and it really actually costs us money to send this book out to you. No joke. So, um, Jared, put the link in there. If you haven't already taken advantage of it, please grab my book, Advancing Your Photography. I want you to have this book. It's paperback, right? I want you to have the actual physical 
book that you can put in your camera bag. You can read. If you're like me, I put margin notes. I highlight stuff. When I get through with the book, I've really consumed it. And you can't do that with, a, you know, a digital copy. You got to have it. So take advantage of that. And I also am offering as part of that a conversation. It's not often that an author will reach out and say, hey, if you've read my book, I'd like to have a talk with you. But you can do that. And you'll you'll see it when you sign up. We'll we'll let you know about that. OK, I think we've covered everything. We got a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff going on here at AYP. I love our community. I love how we keep building and strengthening our community. And there's a core sort of set of values here, which today we kind of exemplified that. Keeping it simple, remembering the, the core of photography is about capturing those images, exposure, timing, lighting. How simple, right? We don't get mystified and lost in all the other stuff that you can get trapped in. It's like if you're going to go out and drive, the thing to do is look out the window. If you have so much attention on, you know, the gadgets and stuff in your car, we know that's dangerous. So, you know, that's why we don't text while we're driving. That's why we don't, you know, have our attention consumed in other things. We want our attention out the window looking at what's going on in the world around us. All right, well, I think we've covered everything. I'll see you guys tomorrow. A couple of last-minute things. Remember to subscribe and enable the bell. Remember to leave your comments, share the videos, like them. And last but not least, and please say this with me, remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Love you guys. Stay well, stay safe, and stay creative. We'll see you soon.